So thank you so much for the introduction and the warm welcome. You know, since I'm such an avid runner, I kind of thought about just running here from Fort Wayne. It's not that far to have, maybe, you know, 40 mile run or so, but nothing I couldn't handle. But we're going to talk about running, we're going to talk about my job as a meteorologist, and some other just sort of general principles as far as setting goals and, and dreaming big for your life. But I just want to thank you all for the warm welcome. This is my first time up at Howe, and it's really great to be here today. I'll try not to move around too much. As a meteorologist, I do kind of have a habit of, you know, moving back and forth up with the green screen. So I'll try to stay stationary for the purposes of the camera, but thank you very much again for the introduction. So for those of you, most of you probably don't recognize me, but I'm a broadcast meteorologist, and it's the one job where you get paid to be wrong, which I really love about my job, you know? Batting 300, it's, it's great in baseball, it's also great for meteorology, you know? If you're right 30% of the time, you still get your paycheck. So if you don't like today's rain, um, you can complain after the presentation here. But today we're gonna to talk about not only planning your future, but also living out your future. Those are two key components to the goal setting process. And as um, the introduction mentioned, broadcasting and meteorology is something that I've been planning for a very, very long time. It's something that I really have the pleasure of actually living out in real life now. A lot of people focus so much on the planning process that they never actually really see those goals to fruition. And a lot of people also have big goals, but they're not willing to put in the work for it. So I want to talk about those two key components, planning out and also living out your future. I know. Many of you at a pivotal stage in your life, you're sort of thinking about where do you want to be, what do you want to do, um, what are your goals and aspirations. And I'd really just love for all of you to really live out those goals and see them come to reality. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Hopefully some valuable life lessons for all audience members and all walks of life. So this first question, this is a question you've probably gotten if you've ever had a job interview. It's a question you'll probably have if you're ever applying for colleges or positions. It's a question that your significant other might ask you later at some point in life. But where do you see yourself in five years? And it's kind of an annoying question because it's one of those typical icebreaker interview questions. But it is an important question to ask yourself because if you don't have any vision for five years from now, then you don't have any vision for 20 years from now. And planning for your future is something that's very crucial if you want to really set out and achieve those goals in life. So. I'm sure all of you in your mind have some vision for yourself, where you see yourself in five years. You know, when I was your age, I was definitely starting to think about going to college in order to pursue meteorology, pursue broadcasting. I didn't need to go to a four-year university, so college was obviously in the back of my mind. I'm sure that's something many of you are thinking about, whether it's a military school or whether you're going to go to a four-year university after serving. Of course, serving in the armed forces is something that's an incredible contribution to society. I'm going to talk a little bit about my grandpa Goodis later, but um, when he was 18, he was drafted, went off to Europe to serve World War II. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge, so he had to forego college in order to serve his country. So that's something that was definitely on his radar at that point in life, attending college, serving in the armed forces. Definitely two goals for the future that are probably on your mind. What else do you want to do in five years? Traveling the world. A lot of people love to travel, to see new places, to get out of Indiana, just to explore. And, of course, that's a great goal to have, but you've got to know how you're going to get there, which we're going to talk about in a second, too. Working a full-time job. Well, if you do ever work a full-time job, you're probably going to get this question again, where do you see yourself in five years? Because that is a pretty typical interview question. Um, so working a full-time job is a great goal to have. You know, it was something that I was thinking about when I was, when I was your age, working as a broadcast meteorologist. And last but not least, starting a family. That's something that a lot of people aspire towards really, really, it's not that far in the future for many of you. Last but not least, anyone want to say goodbye to Indiana weather, move someplace warm? Yeah, it's a lot warmer down south, but we love our Indiana weather sometimes, except when it's raining like today. But how will you get there, I think, is the more important component to this question. So part one is where do I want to be? Part two is how will I get there? And that's the part to the question that a lot of people sort of ignore. You know, it's great to have big dreams, it's great to have goals, but this question does prove to be a little bit more difficult. It's really part two that differentiates the dreamers from the achievers. And a big dream without the work ethic required to get there, a big dream without the answer to this question, ultimately is going to remain as just a dream. So we're going to talk a little bit about not only setting those goals for your future, not only having this vision for where you want to be in five years, but also putting in the work and diligently uh, working to get to that point. A lot of people 
know, like I said, where they want to be, but they don't know necessarily what the step is to get there. Point A is where you're at now, point B is where you want to be in the future, and it's that road in between, it's that journey. That's the difficult part. It's knowing not only where you want to be, but also how to get there, what steps are necessary to get there. So as I kind of said, dreams without the work remain just dreams, and unfulfilled dreams, I think one of the saddest things, where people have big goals and people have big visions, they see this amazing vision for their life, but it ultimately never pans out, and they end up just remaining a dreamer. And that's not something I want to have any of you. I want you to be able to achieve pretty much everything you want to achieve in life, not only because you had that goal in the first place, but also because you were willing to work for it. And that's something I'm going to share with my personal story in just a few seconds, is you know, becoming a broadcast meteorologist, becoming a marathon runner, those are things that I aspire toward. Those are goals that I've had for a long, long time. But they didn't happen by themselves. You know, The miles don't run themselves. I didn't become a broadcaster just out of happenstance. They happened because I was willing to put it work. And that's part two of the equation. Not only having big dreams, but also having to work together. On the other hand, you know, if you have the hard work, but if you don't have the dreams, you're gonna end up burning yourself out. And that's an unfortunate product that a lot of people in the United States suffer as well. You know, they show up to work every day, they go to school every day, they're kind of just going through the motions. They live day in and day out, but they don't really know why they do what they do. And asking that bigger question, why, is, is ultimately just as important. Because if you have dreams without work, you know, those will remain just dreams, but if you have work without dreams, you're gonna burn yourself out, you're gonna feel a lack of purpose. And I think those big goals and those big dreams are really what give you a sense of fundamental purpose. And if you don't really have any goals that are important to you deep down individually, you're not really gonna have a sense of drive or a sense of purpose. So I really like for all of you to just, you know, not only set those big goals that are important to you, not necessarily important to those around you or your family or your friends, but things that you want out of yourself, to better yourself, to better the world around you, to better this nation. Those are the goals you should be pursuing and you've got to put in the work because they're not going to achieve themselves. So I know you're probably tired of equations from math class, but here's a basic equation that I kind of advise here. It's those two factors on the left-hand side that will ultimately enable you to get to where you want to go. You know, big dreams are great, but you need hard work as well. And it's the combination of those two factors, dreaming plus the hard work, that'll get you where you need to be. And I think it's great that all of you are here at Howe right now, because that means you're already working hard towards you know, serving the armed forces, towards going to college, towards getting a job eventually. Lots of valuable life lessons that you're learning here that are already going towards that equation to ultimately become successful. So I want to talk a little bit about my own personal story, my adventures as a broadcast meteorologist. Two photos there. On the left-hand side is where I was when I was many of your age cadets. I was in high school at that point. That was my first time at the green screen. And on the right was just a few months ago. That's at my job in Fort Wayne, ABC 21. Um, and I've got a little boot on because I had a running injury. But it's off now and I've overcome that successfully. So this is kind of the trajectory that you need to be thinking about. You know, where am I now, point A, which is on the left-hand side, where do I want to be, point B, on the right-hand side. So a lot of people ask me, and a lot of people have asked me already today since I've been here, like, what got you into weather? Why did you want to be a meteorologist? What really sparked your interest? And it's kind of something that I've really always wanted to do. You know, I grew up in Toledo, Ohio. We got some pretty wild temperature extremes, weather extremes, much like you get up here, much like we get in Fort Wayne. You know, there's cold, there's warm, there's pretty much everything in between. So that wild weather definitely got me interested. And it's something that I've really had a passion for and a dream for since I was a very little kid. But those dreams didn't unfold themselves. I had to work for them. So this is a green screen. Obviously, it doesn't look too professional, and that's because I built it in my basement when I was in high school. So this photo is probably about 16 or 17 years old. You know, I've got an old computer monitor, my parents' microphones, some lamp that we must have had laying around the couch, or the house, but, you know, I made you, and I, I built a green screen. So for those of you who've never been to a TV studio or don't know how it works, it's not actually weather maps behind you when you're doing the weather, it's just a green wall that has the magical power of being able to display any map, any video, any photo right behind you, thanks to the wonderful effects of Chrome. So that's a little secret to being a broadcast meteorologist. You're basically just talking about a green wall, and it's all an illusion. But I think it's a pretty fun job, and it's certainly a job that, that doesn't feel like work to me, because it's something that I've always wanted to do. So like I said, 
some of my earliest childhood memories involve the weather. I've been interested in it for a very, very, very long time. I don't know if you get snow days here, if the weather's ever so bad, you don't have to go to classes, but we got snow days when I went to public. You don't get snow days. That's unfortunate. They were great in public school growing up. But it's something that every kid looks forward to. You know, you get to sleep in a little bit, you get to go sledding, ice skating, whatever, and just drink hot chocolate all day, not do any homework for sure. But I spent my snow days, instead of hanging out with my friends, I would check the weather. I would wake up when it snowed outside, I'd wake up at five or six o'clock in the morning, sometimes even before my parents, I would go down the stairs, run down the stairs, excited. I'd step out the door, sometimes wearing sandals or flip-flops because I was so eager, and I would stick a ruler on the ground and measure the snowfall. And it's something I still remember to this day because my mom would always yell at me for wearing sandals in the snow, but I had to get out there as fast as possible to measure the snowfall. And then I would come back inside, I would flip on the TV and watch the local meteorologist. And that's something I did every single snow day growing up. I remember from when I was seven or eight years old all the way through high school. So meteorology is something that's always been very near and dear to my heart. And a lot of the memories that I have growing up involve, involve the weather. That's something that always has been very interesting to me. So it's a goal that I've had for many, many years. It's a dream, it's an aspiration that I've had for many years. And now I'm just very grateful to be living it out as a broadcast meteorologist in Fort Wayne. So you've got to put in the hard work, obviously. You know, having an interest in something, having a passion or a desire to achieve something is great. And it's, it's important to have those dreams because like I said, no one wants to be a workaholic without any real big goals or aspirations or dreams. But it was the hard work that ultimately, ultimately got me to this point. So, I still got photos of it. This is something I did back in high school when I was probably about 16 or 17 years old. Um, I would highly recommend tornado machines if you ever have to do a science project. It wasn't that difficult to make, but my dad helped me out with it. Oops, that was my high school graduation. But, um, so basically, you take a bathroom exhaust fan, which sort of pulls the air out, four-sided box with little plexiglass panels on the side, and there's little slits in each one of the sides that let air in, kind of like a tornado would form. And we do get tornadoes sometimes around here. I hope you've never seen one in person. I hope you never have to see one in person, but they do happen. So this kind of mimics how a real-life tornado works. You know, you let air in the side, the air swirls around, and then the bathroom exhaust fan on the top sucks it all up, and then with a little bit of dry ice, you can sort of see everything spinning around like an actual tornado. So this was just one example of something that I did to get from point A to point B, to put in the work, willing to learn more about meteorology, and to to sort of pursue my passion, my dreams. So I did graduate high school, went to school in the Toledo, Ohio area, so not too far down the road, pretty much just down US 24, about an hour and a half away. I could, could probably run there, which we'll talk about in just a bit too, but it's a nicer drive. So that's me at high school graduation. Ultimately, I did go on to four-year university. It's something that some of you might be considering down the road, whether it's right after or maybe a few years after serving. But I did graduate, I had the opportunity to go to school in snowy, cold Ithaca, New York. It's pretty much in the middle of New York. I don't know if any of you have ever watched It's a Wonderful Life, but it's a, it's a great Christmas Eve movie I've always watched. It's kind of in that general same vicinity geographically. You know, middle of nowhere, New York. It's a lot of snow, a lot of cold. But it prepares you to be your own, just because lots of wild weather up there. So that's a photo of me and my parents up in Ithaca, New York, right after my college graduation. And I'm definitely thankful for all the opportunities that, that my parents provided me, that my family and friends and loved ones provided me. But it's that process of seeing the goal come closer and closer and closer that's really, really valuable and rewarding. And the older I got, the closer I came to achieving my dream. At this point, I was just a few months away from starting my first job in Fort Wayne. But I could just see it, I could almost taste it. And it was something that I really wanted for my entire life. And to get to this point, not only graduating high school, but also graduating college, and being just a few months removed from my first job, it felt really, really exciting. And for a good portion of my life, you know, it's something that I wanted to do is to become a broadcast meteorologist. I'm probably not a whole lot older than some of you, but for probably more than half my life, you know, for 10, 15 years, I really, really wanted to get to this point. And now part three is the part that I'm actually living out. So big dreams plus hard work, success. And success obviously takes on different meanings depending on who you are, you know. Being happy is, is success. Achieving your dream job is success. 
you know, serving your country is success. They're all just a different varieties of success. But for me personally, you know, living out a dream that I've had for the majority of my life and doing something that I view as a hobby, as a fun pastime rather than a job, that's my definition of success. And serving the Fort Wayne community is something that's very, very important. So I want to talk a little bit about running now. Running is one of my biggest hobbies. It's something I absolutely love doing um, outside of work. And it's also something that's taught me a lot about the goal setting process. So what got me into running to begin with is actually somewhat related to meteorology. So when you're applying for a job, you have to put together a resume and a cover letter, but you've got to go one extra step when you're applying to be a meteorologist. And that's putting together a demo reel, which is basically a video montage of all of some of your best clips from on-air performances. So I took all my internship tapes, you know, was putting together my demo reel, basically a video trying to show off to news stations. And as I was putting together my demo reel, this was the summer before my senior year at Cornell, I just noticed that I just didn't look like the best version of myself in terms of my performance. I was sluggish, I was lethargic, I was very low in energy. I just didn't seem like I was having fun out there at the green screen. And those of you that have ever watched me know that I do like to have a lot of fun with my job, and I'm much more energetic now than I was back then. But I went three years of college. I enjoyed the all you can eat dining halls a little too much, never exercised. You know, it really physical, physical um, exercise and training was not something that was at all important to me. And when I looked at my demo reel and I was starting to put that together, I just said, John, you're not the best version of yourself. You're not who you could be. You need to set new goals and you need to have bigger dreams in terms of that aspect of your life. So I was certainly coming closer and taking strides to achieving one goal of my life, which is the career goal. But in terms of other aspects of my life, I was maybe neglecting those. So I kind of got into running the summer before my senior year at Cornell as a method of just feeling better, of looking better, of, of improving myself physically. And it really made a world of difference and is continuing to change my life um, and will continue to change my life in the future. Now, I'll talk about this particular race in a bit, but I want to talk a little bit about exactly how I got into it. So at first, I couldn't even run a mile without stopping. You know, it was a struggle to walk to class. And to be fair, Central New York's got some pretty rolling hills, but it was really, really difficult, and I was huffing and puffing walking up those hills. Just was not in the best shape of my life. Wasn't feeling as good as I possibly could. But a couple days a week of jogging on the treadmill sort of got me in at least a pattern of trying to run, trying to go out there, trying to put in a little bit of work. So after I started running for a few months, I signed up for my first 5K. It was 3.1 miles. Didn't sound like much now, but at the time, it was one of the biggest accomplishments in my life. So I finished my first 5K, summer before senior year. This was just after starting a few months of running. Um, and I finished alongside my dad and also my sister, who sort of ran it with me. And that still goes down as one of the proudest accomplishments of my life, just because where I was and where I wanted to be and the process of getting from point A to point B and actually improving myself through setting goals. So that was my first 5K. After that race, my dad tells me, he said, John, if you stick with this running thing, I'll buy you a new pair of running shoes. Uh, hopefully that's enough motivation for you. And I, I obviously wanted a fresh pair of kicks, so I took him up on the offer and he bought me a pair of running shoes if I signed up for a half marathon and I stuck with the running thing. Now a half marathon, for those of you not familiar, that's 13.1 miles, which is even a pretty decent drive around town, but to run that is something that at the time seemed incredibly difficult. I'd only been running for two or three months, so the prospects of running 13.1, you know, still seemed insurmountable at the time. And I didn't really know much about training, I didn't really know much about what I should be doing in terms of my running, but I just got out there and I ran every day. And I put in the work, I at least got out the door. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to do, is just get out the door, take that first step. Once you take the first step, the hard part's done, you know, the rest of the run comes a little bit more naturally. But just getting the motivation, finding the intrinsic desire to not only set a goal, but also put in the work to achieve that, is I think what's the most difficult thing. And for me personally, just taking those first strides, just getting out the door, running four or five times a week that first summer, really, really helped me. So August of 2015, I finished my first 13.1 mile race, that half marathon. It was up in Baroda, Michigan, which is kind of probably not too far away from here. It's sort of up in Michigan wine country. But at that time, 
it was one of the biggest achievements ever. It was something I didn't even view as physically possible. But I did it nonetheless, and that's, again, one of my proudest accomplishments. It's all about the journey. It's about setting those goals for yourself and then taking baby steps to achieve them. So when I was making my demo reel that summer before my senior year at Cornell, I didn't even imagine that I'd be able to run 13.1 miles, but that was just the start of the journey as I found out. So when I went back to school for my senior year of college, I kind of fell off the wagon as far as training goes. You know, I started staying up late, hanging out with friends, went back to the all you can dining halls, wasn't really running as much as I should, but eventually I realized you're falling off track. You're not making strides to get to where you need to be and achieve your goals. And I knew that I had to get back into training, otherwise I was gonna fall off and lose the progress that I made that summer. So I made the great mistake of signing up for my first marathon. It's 26.2 miles, which is a far enough drive to begin with, but I decided I wanted to run it. So I signed up for the Ann Arbor Marathon in the beginning of my senior year of college. And I know that's the last thing that everyone college wants to do is train for a, a long distance race. It involved personal sacrifices on my part for sure, you know. I had to go to bed early on Friday night so I could wake up for my long runs on Saturdays. I still hung out with my friends but did have to forego a few of those opportunities for the sake of training. But it was so worth it because it enabled me to see those dreams that I set for myself come to fruition and come to reality. So spring before I graduated, just a few months before, I went up to Ann Arbor, Michigan I'm an Ohio State fan, by the way, so that is the only excuse that I'll ever have to go up to Ann Arbor. But it's still a nice town, regardless um, of the university there. But it was a, an experience that I'll never forget. It wasn't all smooth sailing. You know, people say that the halfway point of a marathon is not 13.1 miles, it's actually 20 miles. Because the last six miles is just as hard, if not harder, than the first 20. And just when you think things are going perfectly according to the plan, you know, you will have a rude awakening that they are not. And that happened to be at my first marathon. You know, I was cruising along for the first 10 miles, the first 13 were fine. 20 miles, I was still feeling great. 22 miles, still feeling good. And then, it hit me. They call it hitting the wall and running. It is a physical and a literal and a metaphorical thing. It involves basically just feeling your whole world crashing down on you in the late parts of a race. You know, you feel physically depleted, your legs are exhausted, you're hungry, you're tired, you're thirsty. Pretty much everything is going wrong, and it's the ultimate test of mental will. Whether it's running or life, you're definitely going to have an experience like that at some point, hitting the wall where you feel like everything is just not going according to plan. And it's really not a fun experience, it's really not. But it's those tough experiences that really define you as a person, and those tough experiences that make it even more rewarding when you have to get to your goal. Because if you don't have any challenges, if you don't have any setbacks, and what fun is the goal setting process? It's all about those obstacles, I think, that really make your achievements even more valuable. So 22, 23 miles into the race, I'm cruising along, still doing six and a half or seven minute mile pace, and then I just slow down to a walk, basically. And it's one of the most humbling experiences I've ever felt because I thought everything was going perfectly. I was so close to the finish line, I could almost taste it. And then I just start walking. And the last two miles of the race, you know, I physically couldn't run at that point. I was totally depleted, my body was shot, I went out too fast, I was paying the prices, you know, for running a little bit too aggressively. But nonetheless, I walked in for the last two miles and I did finish my first marathon. And that's still something that I'm incredibly proud of, especially that first one. It's, it's a bucket list item for many. I have gone on to run several more, and hopefully many more in the future, but the process of overcoming that obstacle of hitting the wall certainly made it even more meaningful. Now, I did eventually qualify for Boston, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, but it's really those failures that really teach you lessons. The failures in between point A and point B that, that make it even more meaningful. So, Four for Fitness is a, is a big marathon race in Fort Wayne where you run around the streets of downtown and you finish on Parkview Field where the, the local baseball team plays. And this was a race that I had very high ambitions for. I set big goals for, I was determined to finish it. Now, my dad, who's there on the left, is one of the ones who kind of got me into running. He inspired me to start. He bought me my first pair of running shoes. And he was running the half marathon this year, which started an hour and a half after the full marathon. And before the race, he told me, the only way I'm gonna finish before you is if I cheat the course, because there's no way I'm faster than you. 
Now my dad loves running, but he's not the fastest one in the world. Um, as I have been jogging with him a few times, but it's still great that he gets out there and runs. So I went out for my first three miles, feeling great, going fast, and that hitting the wall feeling that I felt 23 miles into my first marathon hit me just three miles into Fort Worth Fitness. It's the worst feeling in the world, feeling totally empty and depleted when you know you still have 23 miles left to run. So I was slowed down to a walk, just three miles into running this, and it's because I was overtrained. I was massively overtrained. I was doing too much too soon, too much intensity, too many miles, and it all just hit me, and it was miserable. But mentally, I knew that it was just a challenge that needed to be overcome. You know, I could have dropped out of the race. I could have stopped at an aid station and just, you know, called my dad and told him I'm done. I could have went home, but I decided to keep going. And it was tough to keep going because I couldn't run at the pace that I wanted to. It was a humbling experience to start walking three miles into a 26-mile race. So I just jogged it. And there were points in the race where I felt like I couldn't and I had to take walking breaks. There were points where I had to stop at the aid stations and eat and drink. But ultimately, just the process of overcoming that really, really deep, gritty pain made this even more meaningful. But to make the race even more special, my dad, who was running the half marathon, who said there is no way he would finish before me, I'm 25 miles into the race. I am absolutely miserable, and I've been mis miserable for pretty much the whole race. But I see a guy ahead of me who kind of looks like my dad. He was wearing the same yellow hat, which I remember very, very vividly. So my dad was finishing up his half marathon just at the same point as I was finishing my marathon. So I tapped him on the shoulder. I'm like, Dad, how are you doing? And he's so delirious from running his race that he barely even knows what's going on. But he, he's shocked. He almost thought that you know maybe I finished already and I came back out on the course to run with him. But we got to run that last mile together. And that mile that I ran with my dad, it was mile 13 for him and mile 26 for me, is one of the most special miles that I would ever have. And had I run according to plan, had I finished that race as fast as I wanted to, I would have finished probably half an hour or an hour before my dad. But the fact that I was slowed down, the fact that I overtrained and had to jog it, meant that I got to finish this race with my dad. So we crossed the finish line together at the same time. You know, my arm was around his shoulder. I'm a little bit taller than him, easy to notice. But we were, we finished the race together. And that will go down as one of the most memorable runs probably of my entire life. And it's because of that obstacle that I had to overcome. So that was a lesson in failure. Now ultimately, if you set big goals and you work hard enough, you will have your successes in life. They're not all going to come every time. You know, you're going to have obstacles. You're going to have encounters where things don't go according to plan. But the successes feel so much better because of the failures. You know, if you never have any failures, the successes aren't going to be that great. But it's because of the failures, I think, that achievement and accomplishment really feel special. So about a year ago, actually, I decided that I wanted to run a race in honor of my grandma Birchfield, my dad's dad, who was suffering from Parkinson's disease. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Parkinson's, it's basically both a physical and a cognitive degenerative disease. It causes tremors, it causes hallucinations, it causes you to lose your ability to speak and really think rationally, and all sorts of these detrimental side effects. It was really, really sad to watch my grandpa, who used to be a physician, who used to be a hobbyist, who had so much going for his life, and just watch him deteriorate. So I said, I want to run a race for my grandpa, and I really want to show that I'm committed to this cause, and that I'm dedicated to this cause. And at that point, I had already run four marathons, I had already qualified for Boston, and I really wanted to challenge myself on a new level. So I did a quick Google search. I searched ultra marathons in Indiana, which is a distance greater than 26.2 miles. It's basically a run for crazy people. And I am dedicated a little bit crazy when it comes to running these distances, but to me, it's all about the goal setting process. And it's about becoming a better version of yourself. So I signed up for a 50 mile trail ultra marathon. Some of you may be familiar with Chain of Lake State Park. It's in um, Noble County up in Albion, in the Albion area. So I signed up for that race and I said, I want this to be much more than just a running race. I want this to be a race in honor of my grandpa. I want to run 50 miles for grandpa to raise money for Team Fox, which is basically the grassroots fundraising organization for the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Most of you probably know who Michael J. Fox is from the movies, but he has suffered Parkinson's for years and years and years and set up a great charitable foundation for that. So I said, I'm going to run 50 miles and I'm going to do it for my grandpa. And I think having that 
motivator, having that deeper purpose besides just running, really set me apart from my competitors and really made training so much more rewarding. You know, every time I stepped out onto the trails for a run, I wasn't running for myself. I wasn't running for my own personal goals and personal time. I was running for someone else, someone who I love dearly. I was running for my grandpa. And I think that's what made the process ever so special. Just like when I signed up for my first 5K, the thought of running a marathon seemed insane and impossible. Signing up for a 50 mile race seemed impossible at the time. You know, after running a marathon, I essentially had to double that. And when I signed up for this race, I had no idea how I was going to do it. I had no idea that it was even feasible for me to do, but I still signed up because I wanted to show my commitment to my grandpa. So I trained hard all summer, went up to the trails every week, ran a lot of miles, put in the work, did those necessary steps required to get from point A to point B to achieving your goals. Even the night before the race, when I went to bed, I tried to sleep because I didn't sleep much. Even the night before the race, I was still skeptical that this was something that was physically possible. You know, the longest run of my life, the night before this race, was 27 miles. And I thought, wow, I've got to add on another 23 to that. This is going to be a tough day. And of course, the weather made it more tough. Why well, shouldn't it be? It was a meteorologist. But it was a funny start to the day. It was a little bit icy out on the bridges. The trails were a bit sloppy. It wasn't the prettiest start. And this race started at 6.30 in the morning. So it was pitch black. I was wearing a headlamp strap on my forehead to illuminate the trails. And it was just obstacle on obstacle on obstacle. Lots of challenges to overcome. But I set out my game plan. And every single mile, every single time things got tough, when the going got tough, I just thought about my grandma. And I thought about why I was running this race. Having those big dreams means that you have a fundamental sense of purpose, that you have a why that governs everything you do. And having that why that extended beyond just running made it so much more valuable and it made the race more endurable. So this was one of the days that proved to be successful for me. You know, I have had a number of failed races, like I told you, the Fort for Fitness race didn't go according to plan, my first marathon definitely didn't go according to plan, but everything went just about perfectly on this particular day. You know, I was still feeling good through the first marathon, I was feeling good through 30 miles, which at that point I didn't even know was physically possible, but I kept going. I thought about my grandma every step of the way. It was physically brutal. My legs felt like they were going to give out. They did give out when I crossed the finish line, but I eventually ran 50 miles, and I'm thankful that I was able to win the race, but ultimately it's not the result that proved the most valuable. It's doing something greater for someone who's important to you. And I think that's also important in the goal setting process, is not only deciding what's important for me as an individual, what can I do to better myself, but also what can I do to give back and serve? How can I serve my country? How can I serve my loved ones? What can I do to make my life much more meaningful than just a personal adventure? And it's this journey, I think, that sort of metaphorically represents that whole goal setting process. You know, point B is the finish line of this race where I'm at now. Point A was the start of the race, and it's that journey, that trajectory from point A to point B, the goal setting process that made it meaningful. And it felt so good, especially after the failed races, you know, the successes feel so much better because of the obstacles, because of the challenges and the hardships that you have to face in life. Now, I obviously had a great support group there. It was my friends and family who really made the event even more special. At this point, I was totally sidelined in a lawn chair. I couldn't even move. When, when I tried to stand up, I just, my body was like, nope, you can't stand up at this point. So my brother had to drive me home that day. But it was really great to have my friends and family there as well. So last but not least, I want to sort of talk about my future goals. And hopefully they inspire you to set future goals for yourself. So as I've mentioned many times, you know, not every race I've run has been a success. My first marathon didn't qualify for Boston. Second marathon didn't qualify for Boston. Third marathon, I thought I qualified for Boston, but then they changed the cutoff line, so I didn't qualify for Boston. And number four, the Veterans Marathon in Columbia City. That's the one. It was windy, it was cold, the conditions were brutal, it was hilly. Pretty much everything was saying, no, this is not gonna be your day, but I decided that it was gonna be my day, and I ran the race of my life at that point, and successfully qualified for Boston there. So, as I mentioned, it's important sometimes, and a lot of the time, to make your goals extend beyond yourself as an individual. And it took me a little bit of a while to identify my purpose in training for Boston. 
But I suffered a stress reaction training in December. I was, you know, logging about 100, 110 miles a week, which was just too much for my body. And my body just said, no, this is too much, John. So I had, I suffered a stress reaction. I spent a lot of time in a boot, which you saw in the green screen photo. You know, I was sidelined from running for several months. And I think it's that injury that actually served as an opportunity in disguise. It's that injury that gave me my sense of purpose, that told me why I was running the Boston Marathon. And I don't want to run the Boston Marathon just for my own personal gain. I don't want to run it to get a fast time or a high place. I wanted to run Boston Marathon to give back and serve and help others. So when I suffered my injury, not that this is anything comparable, but it sort of helped me sympathize a bit more with, with my grandpa goodness. I, was, I wasn't the closest with him. He had a big family. He was a little bit jaded from serving in the Second World War, but he did suffer injury. He earned a Purple Heart for serving in the Battle of the Bulge. Now, as I mentioned, he had to forego college so that he could go overseas at age 18. So he was pretty much the same age as a lot of you in this room, younger than me at the time. But you know, he lost his finger fighting in the Battle of the Bulge, which was one of the pivotal battles on the European front. It was crucial, and he was a part of it. And for his service, I'm eternally grateful. And I'm also grateful for my own injury that sort of helped me identify with that and helped me really see the sacrifices that people make for the sake of this country. And that sacrifice is a sacrifice that I try to make with all of my goals, it is a personal sacrifice to help and to benefit others. So in training for the Boston Marathon, yeah, I want to finish the race, yeah, I want to run a fast time. Those are all personal goals that I have, and I do have means of achieving them from getting from point A to point B there. But it's really the fundraising component. It's the aspect of giving back, serving, helping others, and inspiring others that makes the process so much more rewarding. So I decided that in honor of my first Boston Marathon, I was going to raise money for the Wounded Warrior Project to give back to injured veterans. So that's a fundraiser that I'm still currently in the process of enacting. Boston Marathon is April 15th, so it's coming up fast on Patriots Day, actually. That's when we'll be out in Boston. And the whole process of setting a goal, of watching that goal come to fruition, of not only dreaming big, putting in the work, of the entire journey, both the successes and the failures, that's what makes it so special. And you know, the fundraising aspect, making it about big, something bigger than just running, it's just icing on the cake, really. And it's all part of this amazing journey. Now, as far as future goals go, as if 50 miles wasn't crazy enough, I decided that I'm going to double that this fall and run a 100-mile ultra on the trails. Now, as I mentioned, my parents still live in Toledo. I kind of grew up in Toledo. It's basically like running from Fort Wayne to Toledo, so I might as well just start doing that to save on gas money. But, you know, it's, it's going to be a tough race. It's something that still, right now when I conceptualize running 100 miles, I'm like, I don't know, John, this, is, this might be it. This might be your limit. But I know that I'll do it. It's, it's all about dreaming big, setting that goal. This is the goal right now, and point A is where I'm at right now. I, I generally know what I need to do to get to that point. I need to train harder than I was before. I need to do back-to-back -back long runs. All these sorts of things that require the training and of life that will help me get to that point. But I do think it's important to set these crazy big goals. Even though running 100 miles is something many of you will probably never do, would probably have no desire whatsoever to do, it's sort of representative of any goal that you set in life. You know, sometimes you just have to take the leap, and sometimes you just have to sign up and, and go all in and throw yourself under the bus and sign up for that goal and work towards that goal. So when you look for yourself in the future, when you envision where you want to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, just remember that having that goal, having that vision is important, but the goal's not going to achieve itself. You know, life's not going to magically unfold the way you want it to without putting in the work. I wish it worked like that, but at the same time, it's the hard work, the perseverance, the blood, sweat, and tears, all of that makes it so much more meaningful when you finally get to that point. You know, if you didn't have any obstacles to overcome, it just really wouldn't feel so good when you actually achieve what you want to achieve. So when, when you look to your vision for five years from now, or any time in the future, just remember that you've got to have those dreams, but you've got to have the work, and you've also got to be willing to put up with obstacles. And you've got to realize that it's not going to be a smooth ride. There will be speed bumps and there will be impediments that try to get in your way. But as long as you hang on to that vision, as long as you keep it in your mind, as long as you think about your original goals and where you want to be, 
I think that you will achieve your goals, and I have faith that all of you will accomplish what you want to accomplish. And I know this is a point in your life, as it was when I was in high school, where you really have a lot of uncertainty about the future. You're thinking about, well, I don't know if I want to do this, I don't know if I want to do that. At this point in your life, many of your decisions have been sort of scripted by your parents, your family, your friends, obligations, expectations. You know, a lot of the things you've probably done so far have been because they're what other people want out of your life. But when you look to the future, you're designing your own future, you're writing your own story, you are unfolding and running your own journey. And it's an exciting time because you really get to plan and go and dream for what you want out of life. So I hope that this inspired you in some way to set big goals, dream big, and also work to achieve them. And it's been really great being here at Howe, so thank you all for the, the warm welcome. And hopefully we get some warm weather too. <laughs> Let's give him another round of applause. Yeah. So, on behalf of Prince Team, the Academy President, he'd like me to present you with this coin for excellence. So it's the President's coin for excellence. On the front, you can see we have our the Hal Military Academy crest with a crown symbolizing academic excellence, and then on the bottom, fides et honor, faith and honor, our institutional values, and on the back. We've got all five crests of the different services with Historic St. James, which we toured earlier today. So thank you again for coming. Thank you.